Organic Chemistry Chem 213, Exam 3 Information, Part 1. We're going to start off this section talking about cyclic ethers, including epoxides. So cyclic ethers are part of our heterocyclic compounds. We're going to both have carbon and oxygen within the ring itself. Cyclic ethers pretty much behave like they're acyclic ethers. They're very unreactive, and so they tend to be used as solvents. The exception are epoxides, those three-membered rings, and we'll take a closer look at those. So let's go ahead and take a look at dioxane. Di, meaning two, and the ox piece here is telling us we're going to have two oxygens. So the structure of a 1,4-dioxane would be a six-membered ring. Two of them are oxygens. Tetrahydrofuran and furan. Both of these are commonly used as solvents. In fact, THF is what you're going to see over reaction arrows very commonly. So here's tetrahydrofuran, and furan also has the oxygen in the five-membered ring, but it has two carbon-carbon double bonds. So the difference between furan and tetrahydrofuran happens to be the number of hydrogens, and that is shown in its name. So let's take a look here. Tetra, meaning four, hydro. A tetrahydrofuran has four more hydrogens than the furan. And again, most often you'll see THF over arrows, and this is the exact structure they're speaking of. So epoxanes, let's take a look at these three membered rings. They're also, also known as oxyranes, three membered cyclic ethers. Now, what can happen is we can have more carbons coming off on this part here and here, or even the other side. The piece that is the oxyrane is this piece here, the two carbons and the oxygen that form the three-membered ring. So keep that in mind. Now, the reason why these are a lot more reactive than any of the ethers, remember, ethers in general are very unreactive, it's because of the strain, the angle strain that's going on here. And if you recall, the typical angle that is most preferred is that tetrahedral 109.5 degrees, and this is 60 degrees, so it's definitely far from that. So this is what gives epoxides their unusual chemical reactivity. So let's go ahead and take a look at naming some of these epoxides. We have the non-systematic name, and this describes the method of formation, or basically it's derived from the name of the starting material. So it'll have an E and E ending because all of these were formed from alkenes, and you'll be seeing that in part of the name. And then now we have the systematic name, the newer way of naming it, where epoxide comes, I'm sorry, where epoxy comes into the name, and this describes the location of the epoxide ring. So I'll give you two examples here. So here we have the smallest epoxide you can have, just two carbons and hydrogens on both sides of it. So the non-systematic name would be ethylene oxide. So ethylene would have been the carbon-carbon double bond with just two carbons, and its common name was ethylene, and so it would be an ethylene oxide. So the systematic name of this would be epoxy ethane, and this is telling me, epoxy is telling me that I have an oxygen bonded to two adjacent carbons. And since I only have two carbons total, I don't have to give a numbering system for clarification. There's no other place it can go. So let's contrast that with, we have four carbons now. Non-systematic names. So let's look at this. In order for this oxygen to be between these two, the starting material would have been a carbon-carbon double bond between carbons number two and three. But there's also another feature I want you to notice. I actually have cis happening here. Notice the location of these hydrogens here, how they're relative to each other. Remember, we don't have rotation in a carbon-carbon double bond, and we also don't have rotation in a ring. So when we see this kind of orientation, we are looking at the um, needing to include the term cis, in this case, in the name. So non-systematic name, this was derived from a cis-2-butene, and now we add the word oxide, and that's the non-systematic way of naming that. So then let's take a look at it from the systematic way. We need to tell the name, or the reader in the name, exactly where this oxygen is bonded. Is it, in this case, it's bonded to carbon two and three. But we still need to maintain the fact that it's cis, so don't forget that part. So we have cis, two, three, epoxy, butane. 
So for example, one of the things we could do is we could have a trans 2,3 epoxy butane where I would have these in the trans version towards each other. Or I could even practice by having a 1,2 epoxy butane. And so take a look at those, practice some of those. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and have you practice naming the following. So the first part here will be, the first line here would be its non-systematic name. The second one would be its systematic name. And then go ahead and wait on the third one because I actually want to show you the historical way of naming some of these. And I haven't introduced that yet. It's coming right up. So the best thing for you to do is to go ahead and pause the video. So what I want you to do is pause the video and see how you do with the systematic, non-systematic names, and then restart the video and see where you see how you've done. Okay, I hope you've had a chance to try this on your own. If not, go back and pause it. I would like you to try this on your own. So let's take a look at our first in letter A here, our first one here. I have a cyclopent happening. The starting material would have been a cyclopentene, a carbon-carbon double bond coming from here. So its first name we're going to look at, its non-systematic name would be cyclopentene oxide. Now its systematic name would be epoxy cyclopentane. And what's going to happen on this is I don't need to put a number in front of this because there's no clarification on the address. We don't need to show where that is. So that's why it doesn't have that in front of it. Now this last name here, go ahead and fill this one in, cyclopental oxyrane. And I will explain these once I have all three of them up there. I'll explain this a little more when we get to that. All right, letter B, we have one, two, three carbons. And we had probably a car, oh, not probably. We did have a carbon-carbon double bond connecting these. So we started off with propylene, epoxy propane, and propylene and epoxy propane, again, will not have any kind of numbering system happening because I don't have to have clarification. I could have had this epoxy piece left of center or right of center, and I'd have the exact same molecule. And then again, this historical name, methyl oxyrane. Again, I'll get to that in just a minute, but go ahead and fill that in. So let's take a look at letter C. This one is not showing, cis, well, it doesn't have cis or trans features involved because I don't have the hydrogens. And in fact, the common name, the original name of this would be tetramethylethylene oxide. So I'm not quite sure if you got this. I think I probably would have gone towards the butane myself on this, but its older name is tetramethylene oxy, uh, oxide. So taking a look at this, let's take a look one more time. We have an ethylene here is where it came from. Tetramethylene oxide is how you would name that one. It's a little bit of a variation from its starting material, how we would name that. All right, let's take a look at this one. This is its systematic name. Let's start at the end because that's pretty much the best place to go on most organic compounds. We have a butane happening, one, two, three, four. And I have my epoxy on carbon two and three. So the 2,3 epoxy butane takes care of all of this part through here. Now what is not included in that part of the name are the substituents coming off of it, and that would be a methyl group here and a methyl group here. And so that would be a 2,3 dimethyl 2,3 epoxy butane. And then its historical name, tetramethyl oxyrane. So let's take a little closer look at this historical naming. All right, I want you to see this oxyrain piece right here. We have oxyrain, oxyrain, oxyrain. Take a look at this piece here. This is an oxyrain, this is an oxyrain, and this is an oxyrain. Take a look one more time. Let's actually do this one last because it's a little twist since it's on a ring. Let's take a look at this. Do you see this piece here? This is the oxyrane piece. What's left over right here is a single methyl. Do you see how it has a single methyl in front of there? Methyl oxyrane. Methyl oxyrane. Let's take a look at letter C. We have one, two, three, four methyl groups. Tetra methyl Oxyrain. So this is the more historical way of naming it using the oxyrain. 
And then with the cyclo, it is a little different. We do have to keep in mind that the, we do have this ring itself here, and that would be my cyclopental piece. And yes, these two carbons here are both in the oxyrain piece and also in the, in the cyclopental piece. I understand that, but that's just how they happen to do it when it's part of a ring system like this. So this is the um, oxyrain format of naming these. All right, let's talk about making epoxide. The simplest and commercially most important example is ethylene oxide, manufactured from ethylene, air, and a silver catalyst. We also have a temperature of 250 degrees and also pressure, so don't forget to include those pieces in there. So we have our carbon-carbon double bond re uh, reacting with oxygen under pressure, under 250 degrees, and, and also a catalyst of silver and we get out of there ethylene oxide. In the laboratory, epoxides are most commonly prepared from alkenes and organic peroxy acids. The reaction occurs in one step with syn stereochemistry. So syn stereochemistry means we're gonna have the attack happen from the same side of the double bond. So down here, I went ahead and I put the uh, names of the different groups. Alkene, peroxy acid, epoxide, and carboxylic acid. I wanted you to see that. So here's my starting alkene. This is a peroxy acid. This is another functional group you should learn. A peroxy acid. Notice it has a carbonyl group, carbon-carbon double bond. This R group here is just going to follow over here. And then instead of this being a carboxylic acid where you have an OH, I actually have two oxygens, and then my hydrogen. So when we talk about peroxides, peroxides is whenever you have two oxygens next to each other. So this is known as a peroxy acid because this hydrogen right here is available to leave. Now another thing that sometimes we do for organic chemistry is we like to line up the atoms to where you can see the angles of it. Notice I have my carbon-carbon double bond going up here. Well this oxygen is what's going to be bonded to this carbon and this carbon here. So you can see that I kept it together. I actually angled the molecules themselves so you can see that. Keeping in mind most of the time you're not going to get reactants that are lined up really nice like this, but this is also a study tip. If you want to rearrange them yourself, where you put the carbon-carbon double bond like this and the oxygen, you can see where it's going to be attacking that. That is a nice way for you to practice writing the reactions also. All right, so what's going to happen? You'll get your epoxide out of that. This hydrogen here actually joins this oxygen over here. Did you notice this becomes an OH? And this oxygen down here that originally had a single bond to carbon and a single bond to oxygen in that way actually becomes the carbonyl group. So the carbonyl group even changes in this one. So you get two products. You get your epoxide and you get your carboxylic acid. Another way we can make epoxides is from halohydrins. This is an addition of OH and X to an alkene. This gives us a halohydrin. Treatment of a halohydrin with base gives an epoxide. It's known as an intramolecular Williamson ether synthesis. So we have our carbon-carbon double bond happening here. Cl2 and water and what's going to happen is what's going to add across the double bond is actually going to be your chlorine and an OH and an OH group. That's what's going to happen in this step. The second step is sodium hydroxide and water is going to come in there and it's going to expel. This chlorine is going to go away and this oxygen here is going to be the epoxide now. So I have minor secondary products of water and NaCl. So this is showing you this is a two-step reaction. It's showing you what happens in the middle step. This product is actually a product. It's not an intermediate. It's not a transition. It's something we can isolate. So this is a two-step reaction. So one of the ways we can show two-step reactions, I actually have it written over here on the right-hand side. Here's the reagents required for the first step, the second step. So if you're given the reagents in this format, where you have one above the arrow and two above the arrow, you would not give this middle product here. You would only give the final product happening here. The mechanism of what's happening, and this is the mechanism once we have the halogen on there, and the halogen can be 
bromine instead of chlorine, so I wanted to put bromine on here so you could see that. So remember, keeping in mind, this is an intramolecular Williamson ether synthesis. And what happens in a Williamson ether synthesis to make the ether is the halogen goes away and the oxygen becomes the ether piece. So when sodium hydroxide comes in here, what's going to happen is the, um, elect the hydrogen's going to be taken away from our, with our base, and we're going to now have an uh, oxygen with a negative charge. And there's a very small negative charge here. You might want to rewrite that in your notes much bigger so you can see that. Then what's going to happen is a pair of the electrons from my oxide here, the oxygen minus, is going to actually bond to the carbon next door to it. And bromide's a nice leaving group. A pair of electrons are going to go to that, and it'll leave. And this is actually known as an SN2. This is a substitution reaction. And then we will have our epoxide form, and we have bromide left over. So again, this is showing us what's happening on step two. We already have our bromine on here and our OH. So now that we've talked about making them, let's break them open. They're very reactive as we discuss. So we can actually take an epoxide and add water to it in dilute acid at room temperature. Because of the ring strain, it reacts under very mild conditions. And what we can form out of that would be a 1,2-diol, also known as a glycol. Basically, the mechanism that's happening is acid pro protonates the oxygen and water adds to the opposite side. It is an anti-addition, giving us a trans product. So here we have oxygen and epoxide on a ring, and this is where we can most see the anti-addition. What's going to happen is... Once this whole react, remember we have our water coming on there in mild conditions, and what's going to happen is OH is going to be on one side of the ring and the other OH on the other side. So it's a trans product will be formed. So again, if you're showing this reaction on an uh, acyclic, remember we have free rotation around the double bond. So technically, you don't have to show them as being trans, but when you have it on a ring structure, you definitely have to show that. So make sure you know what kind of, of uh, product you're going to get out of that. In this case, only the epoxide ring was broken. In this case, the epoxide ring was broken, but the other cyclic piece remained. So be sure to look at your reactant and your products from that point of view. Ethylene glycol, 1,2-ethane diol. You can get that from an acid-catalyzed hydration of ethylene oxide. So it's abbreviated EG, is primarily used as a raw material in the manufacture of polyester fibers in the fabric industry, and we can also have resins with that and that are used in bottling, PET. It's also used as an antifreeze, and what that does is it lowers the freezing point of water solutions. So here we have ethylene oxide. It's undergoing an acidic reaction. Remember, this is very reactive, mild conditions, and we can form ethylene glycol or it's also known as 1,2-ethane diol. But ethylene glycol is its common name, and that's a name you should add to your groups that you need to know, because I'm sure most people have heard of ethylene glycol, but not necessarily its systematic name of 1,2-ethane diol. And here's just a structure of it for you. All right, let's take a look at some more ring opening reactions, and these two reactions here are going to form a 1,2-alkoxy alcohol. So let's take a look at this. What does this mean? Other nucleophiles, such as alcohols, so we had water before, add similarly to the epoxides. We have acidic conditions. So what's going to happen is we're going to break our ring, and I would like you to predict what you think the product's going to be. I'm curious. Remember, it says alkoxy alcohol. Think about that for just a second and uh, pause the video and go ahead and write your product in here. All right, we have our alk oxy group right here, oxygen, and our alkyl group. And then we have our alcohol group. So, formation of 1, 2 alk oxy alcohol, and that's the product you get from this one. Here's another reaction. This happens to be an organometallic reagent, and so we have sodium with a plus charge and oxygen with a minus charge. And what's going to happen? 
is we're going to also make a 1,2 alkoxy alcohol. And what we're going to have is our OR, whatever group we had here. And we're going to have a hydrogen coming in and making the other side an alcohol. So these are two examples of ring opening reactions that form a 1,2 alkoxy alcohol. Other organometallic reagents that can open a ring, we can use um, our Grignard reagent. We can also use a lithium reagent. So I'm going to show you the Grignard reagent here. One of the things that happens is, is we can actually take whatever R group we have in our Grignard reagent and we can expand it by two carbons. So it's called a two carbon chain lengthening reaction. Well, one of the things I want you to keep in mind when they say that is it's these two carbons we're adding to this. Technically, it could be more than two carbons because what if you had a carbon to the left or, or right here? So technically, it could be more than two carbons. So they're just going the basic raw as small as you can get. You can add two carbons to whatever R group is here, but obviously you can add more. So this is our Grignard reagent. We've seen that before. And so what's going to happen is we're going to break the ring. The R group will attach itself to one of the carbons, and the other carbon will keep the oxygen, and the magnesium, and halogen will go in there. And then a second step reaction is going to remove the magnesium piece of this, and now we've added these two carbons, that's why it says two carbons, these two carbons and whatever else comes with them, and an OH group. So again, this is an organometallic ring opening. And now we're going to take a look at halohydrins from epoxides. In this case, this is not an organometallic. We're actually going to take anhydrous. These three, or these four acids here, we have all the halogens represented this time. And this is one of the few times we can have fluorine and iodine in the same reaction. So this is um, unusual. We usually you only get bromine and, cl and chlorine. So this is kind of nice to see. Remember, these are highly reactive because of the angle strain. So we have HX in ether. So we have an ether in an ether. Gives it something to float around in. And what's going to happen is we're going to get the trans product because we're going to have our OH and our halogen, they are going to be trans to each other, but remember technically trans is relative hydrogen, so our hydrogens are actually going to see that. So we have an anti-addition is basically kind of the way to look at this. Uh, you pretty much have two, not enough room for one to go, or both of them to go on the same side, so it's going to give you the trans product. Again, all halogens are possible for this reaction. This one makes this one kind of unusual. Now we're going to take a closer look at what really happens during the ring opening of epoxides and the regiochemistry involved in this. So when you have different R groups coming off of your epoxide, we need to know if the left side or right side is actually going to be primary, secondary, or tertiary. So let's take a look at this first one here. I have it labeled this carbon right here is bonded to one carbon, two carbons. We can also we have to go this way. This is classified as a secondary carbon. And then this carbon here is only bonded to one carbon directly, so it's a primary carbon. Let's go down to our second example here, and I want you to go ahead and practice ca uh, categorizing. Carbon here is bonded to one, two, three. So this is a tertiary carbon, while this one is only bonded to one, so it's primary. So making sure that you can classify the carbons involved in the epoxide is going to help you with these reactions. So let's take a look at the stereochemistry of this, the regiochemistry of this. When both epoxide carbons are either primary or secondary, so they could both be primary, they could both be secondary, you could have a primary and a secondary like my example. The halogen itself will attack primarily at the less hindered site. What that means is Remember, we're going to add a bromide and, an, and we're going to have an OH, or a, or a halogen, I'm sorry, a chloride bromide. We're going to have our halogen come in here. Our halogen is going to go to the side that is less hindered, meaning primary will get the halogen before a secondary. That's when you either have primary and secondary versing each other. So you're going to actually get two different products out of this, but you're going to get 90% because it says primarily 
you're going to get 90% of the time the halogen is going to go to the less hindered site and it's telling us only 10% of the time will it go here. This is what happens when you have primary and secondary, any combination of that. Now here is a big difference. When one epoxide carbon is tertiary, the halogen attack attacks actually at the more highly substituted site. And this is somewhere between an SN2 and SN1 mechanism. So what happens is the reaction occurs by the backside attack SN2, but a positive charge is stabilized by a tertiary carbocation-like carbocation transition state, which is SN1. So this one you get more 60-40 uh, split. So what's going to happen is most of the time, or the majority of the time, the halogen is going to be on the tertiary and this one over here, if it's primary or secondary, it doesn't really matter. It's going to have it less amount of time. So 60% of the time when you have a tertiary, 60% of the time it's going to go there and 40% of the time it's going to go to the other one. Versus, this is almost exactly the opposite when you have just primary and secondary, the halogen is going to mainly, 90% of the time, go to the less hindered site. So keep that in mind when you're looking at the mechanism and the regiochemistry of acid catalyzed ring opening. So at this point, I have some reactions I want you to go ahead and go through and practice with. So this would be a time for you to go ahead and pause the video. Maybe if you need to go back and look in your notes and check those out, but go ahead and pause the video, finish these reactions, and then come back and check your work. All right, so let's take a look at this. This is an alcohol. And, and acidic conditions. Here's my epoxide. So what's going to happen is I will have an OH and an OCH3 because this R group is a CH3. For letter B, I actually have a phenol, but that is still an alcohol. Keep that in mind. Acidic conditions. And what's going to happen is it's very symmetrical. Notice I also chose a symmetrical reactant in this case. So you actually have the epoxide piece with the phenol here. So now we actually have the phenol group in here. And then this one here, we have HBr. Um, we have got two different products because we have a, let's take a look at this carbon. This one's secondary and this one's primary. So most of the time the halogen is going to go to the less hindered site, which would be here. So did you notice I put major there? And then every once in a while, you'll get a minor product with it here. So when you have symmetrical, like my A and B, doesn't matter what side left or right you put it on. But if it's asymmetrical, take a look at that, especially if you're adding the halogen on there. You want to double check the halogen. If it's primary or secondary, less hindered site. If there's a tertiary, it'll go to the tertiary site more often. All right, go ahead. If you if you didn't get a chance to do these already, go ahead and pause the video and come on back and take a look at these. These are organometallics, these last three. All right, taking a look at my starting material, symmetrical. In fact, all three of these are symmetrical, so it doesn't really matter what side they go on. And take a look at this. I have my OH and my OCH3. So this is the R group here. R group's a little bit bigger here. In fact, this is pretty much the same exact reaction, same starting material. Just notice the only difference was this R group was just a different size. So when you're practicing, just practice with different sizes and shapes. Uh, one of the abbreviations for CH2, CH3 that you will start seeing in literature and in your textbook will be a C2H5. So they go ahead. I wanted to go ahead and give you that so you would be familiar with that. You'd see that every once in a while. And with this third one, I didn't. It's a pretty big reaction, a uh, reactant. So I went ahead. I'm going to put the answer towards the bottom here. So we have one, two, three, four carbons to start off with. This is the smallest of the epoxides. I'm going to increase it by the two carbons on here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, there we go. And we also happen to have the OH group be on the end here, so don't forget about that OH group. All right, let's talk about crown ethers. So these are large cyclic ethers that were discovered in about 1960. The central cavity is electronegative. 
The shape that you see these ethers in, do you see how all of the oxygens are in the center here? That's really what happens to them. All the oxygens tend to go to the center. Remember, every oxygen on here has lone pairs of electrons. And also, coming in, that means you have a lot of electron density in here. So the middle of it, the cavity, is very electronegative, and it attracts cations. So the way you name these, let's talk about naming these first, is... X is the total atoms in the ring. You count all the carbons and oxygens going all the way around. So in this case, you would have 30 carbons and oxygens. And then you use the name crown. And don't forget, there's a dash between 30 and crown. And then the next number Y is, to, or the next portion Y would be the number of oxygens as you go around. In this case, there's 10. And then there is a space. And then you write the word ether. And then sometimes people don't even include the word ether. They'll just say 30 crown 10. Um, there's nothing else that has a crown name in it. So sometimes it's just understood. But I would like you guys to go ahead and put ether there. But there is a space there. So if you take a look at this one, it has 24 atoms total with 8 oxygens. And here's a smaller one where I only have 4 oxygens. Most of the time, notice it's 2 carbons oxygen, 2 carbons oxygen. This smaller one, it's one of the few times where I've seen there's actually three carbons in one of these sets here. So be sure to look out for that. So knowing how to name them or draw them is something you are responsible for. So the uses of crown ethers, actually what's pretty neat about them is remember ethers are very unreactive. Remember these are no longer epoxides. Those are ethers that are very unreactive. And what's unusual about this also is they make great solvents. They're unreactive, but that that electronegative middle can actually capture a cation. And most cations tend to be water soluble. And because an organic layer and water layer don't mix, we've had difficulty getting cations into our organic layer. Usually it's only surface to surface interaction where you have your organic and your, and your aqueous layer, that surface interaction. So now we can actually take that cation and actually bring it into the organic compound. And so this is an interesting concept. And the size of the actual ether, it depends how big or small it is. That's how big or small our physical cation is. So potassium permanganate is solvated by an 18 crown 6 ether. Notice they didn't put the ether there. And this is soluble in benzene. So now we can bring into our organic compound some inorganic salts. And so this is going to actually help us out with that kind of thing. So this next slide here, I wanted to just kind of show you um, the electronegative piece of this. This is a 12 crown 4, 15 crown 5, 18 crown 6. And as we get bigger, you can actually solvate larger cations. So lithium tends to be in the 12, sodium in the 15, and potassium in the 18. And I just wanted to show you the different size crown ethers can solvate different size cations. And also I wanted to show you, I, I kept this picture, This I liked um, the other way that they're showing you how they're naming this. Notice they put this in brackets. That's normally how we're not gonna do it, but I wanted you to understand what that is if you do run across that. Spectroscopy of ethers. So we have IR spectroscopy. Ethers are difficult to identify since there's so many other types of absorptions that occur in where the ethers absorb. You do need to know that it absorbs between 1050 and 1150, but it's not going to be necessarily a, an identifiable piece. You're going to see a peak there and you're going to go, oh, it's ether. You're going to go, oh, a lot of things are in there. After you know it's an ether, you go back and look for it and then you highlight it or mark it. NMR. So at carbon NMR, we have an absorption of the carbons involved in the ether at about 50 or 80. So it is pulled a little further downfield than a normal carbon. Now in proton NMR, we actually have a couple of things that happen in ethers. If you have a standard ether, it'll absorb it. It'll absorb here um, at about 3.4 to 4.5. If you have an epoxide, it actually is a little bit less downfield. Did you notice it's two and a half to three and a half instead? Which we also have to keep in mind though that in a regular hydrogen on an alcohol is also within that range between three and eight. So again you can suspect you have an ether from the NMR 
But once you know the structure, you can go back and truly identify where it's going to be. All right, now we're going to look at sulfur. Instead of having oxygen in our organic compound, we're now talking about sulfur. So sulfur is the element just below oxygen in the periodic table, and there are many oxygen-containing organic compounds that have sulfur analogs. Thiols, where we have SH instead of OH, as we do in an alcohol, thiol are alcohol analogs. And I really liked this structure. I have this for another class, and I wanted to show you. This came from the Timberlake book. This is the active ingredient that makes garlic garlic, and this is the active ingredient that makes an onion an onion. And we know they're very similar to each other. Um, they do have a different odor, but uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting is 2-propene-1-thiol versus 1-propane-thiol. The only difference between garlic and onion is this carbon-carbon double bond over here. You have the SH and at carbon number two, I have a carbon-carbon double bond, whereas in the onion, I don't have that. So I thought that was something interesting to point out to you. Um, we do; These are both examples of thiols. Happens to have a carbon-carbon double bond. And this also gives you an idea of what we're going to do with the naming here. Did you notice the end of the name became thiol? And when you had a carbon-carbon double bond, we still had to take care of that. So we even, um, kind of like when we do with the alcohols, but it's a little more dramatic. We leave the E here. We put the letter or the number of where the SH is on our, and then the part thiol. Now, sulfides, these are the analogs of ethers. So instead of ethers are ROR, sulfides are RSR. So we'll take a look at both of these. Let's name thiols first. Thiols are named in a similar way of alcohols in terms of the numbering of carbons. Uh, you need to keep the terminal E and add the suffix thiol like you saw in the previous example. Now, when the SH group does not have priority, it, it becomes a mercapto. It has a totally different name, mercapto. And I think when the organic chemists were talking about this, they were being quite clever. Basically, sulfur is a capturer of mercury. It's something that can contain mercury. So mercapto is the Latin version of capturer of mercury. So that's where they have that from. It's something you need to learn is mercapto when it does not have priority. So I have three examples here for you. Let's take a look. I have ethane thiol, cyclohexane thiol, and then meta mercapto benzoic acid. So I would like you to go ahead and pause the video, draw the structures, and come on back and check your work. Ethane thiol, two carbons, SH could have been left or right. It would be the exact same structure, same compound if I would have written the SH to the left or right. Just make sure that you have, when you draw this, that the S comes before the H just like you did with the alcohols. This is a condensed structural formula and we're showing the order that they are. Cyclohexane thiol, we don't give it a numbering system because my SH could have been on any of the six corners. Now, meta is only used when we have two things on a benzene ring. We have a benzoic acid, so what's going to happen is, by telling you it's a mercapto, I'm now telling you that benzoic acid has priority over the SH group. This would be a good time for you to, again, take a look at the priority uh, naming, and carboxylic acids are pretty high up on the list. So knowing that you have a benzoic acid and mercapto does not have priority, but it's meta to that, we would have SH and then our COOH. There's a number of ways you can write the benzoic acid piece or the actual carboxylic acid piece. You could also write it as C double bond OOH or COOH. And then if you remember your textbook does CO and it does a subscript to and then H. All of those are definitely acceptable. Use the one that you like the best. So I wanted to go ahead and expand on this mercaptan thing. Uh, mercapto is when it doesn't have priority. And recently in the news, this had to do with the Porter Ranch leaks, is I was hearing on the news 
that one of the gases they were worried about were mercaptans. So I thought I would give you just a little bit of background on mercaptans. So mercaptan is just the basic family of when you have sulfur in there also. So this is not the same as using the name mercapto in the name, but it's using it as a family name, mercaptans. And it, what it does is hydrogen sulfide is mixed with natural gas to give it that pungent smell so you can smell it. Keeping in mind, natural gas has no odor. It's the impurities that you smell. So they add it to keep us safer. Human noses can easily detect sulfur. That's something that we have an alert system for. So other compounds they add to natural gas, not just hydrogen sulfide, they will add ethane thiol. And you should be able to draw that structure. And propane thiol. They're both added to natural gases to give that smell that can warn you. And then I also wanted to look up a few other things, and it says besides utility companies need for McCaptain, there are other trades that use it. So I thought this was kind of fun to add. Industries use it for jet fuel, pharmaceuticals, and livestock feed additives. It's used in many chemical plants. Mercaptan is less corrosive and less toxic than similar sulfur compounds and found naturally in... Rotten eggs, onions, garlic, skunks, and of course, bad breath. In other words, forms of mercaptan can be found in things that smell. I wanted to give you the properties of thiol. thiol thiols have low boiling points, and they really don't have hydrogen bonding. Now, the textbook says it's because of reduced hydrogen bonding. I think they're saying that relative to what oxygen has, but when we remember the definition of hydrogen bonding, Hydrogen bonding happens when hydrogen is directly attached to F, O, or N. So the fact that it says reduced hydrogen bonding, it really doesn't even have hydrogen bonding. So the boiling points are lower. Thiols have a strong disagreeable odor. It's added to natural gas, as we said before, and responsible for the odors of skunks. Thiols are easily oxidized, but yield different products than their alcohol analogs. Um, alcohols, when they're oxidized, we can make different compounds like aldehydes and ketones. Well, when we oxidize sulfide or thiols, we actually get what's called disulfides, two sulfurs next to each other. So we'll be seeing some of those examples. So speaking of skunk, I wanted to show you the family chemicals that skunk sprays have. And I wanted you to go ahead and practice your nomenclature with this. So let's take a look at this. We have E. 2-butene-1-thiol, we have 3-methyl-1-butane-thiol, and the general family of thioacetates. So we haven't talked about thioacetates yet, so this will be the first time you see that. Now these are all volatile, which means they are dispersed easily in the air, and they're easily picked up by the human nose. So I would like you to go ahead and pause the video and draw the structure of the first two, and then come on back and see the general structure of the thioacetate. All right, E2-butene-1-thiol, and then we have 3-methyl-1-butane, I'm sorry, 3-methyl-butane-1-thiol. So for a thioacetate, I went ahead and used an R group here, and it's actually this whole piece here that is the thioacetate, and then we would add other pieces to it when this R group changes. So Acetate, A-C-E-T, we've talked about that before, meaning two carbons. You have one carbon, two carbons right here. This is where the acetate piece comes from. So thioacetate. Again, this is one of the functional groups you'll want to know. Now, I have to come back to this one here. This is E2-butene-1-thiol, and we're talking about the um, E and Z conformation on the high and low. So be sure to take a look at that from the viewpoint of Remember, cis and trans is when you have your hydrogens relative to each other. So this one is when you don't. So one of the problems I have with this name E2-butene-1-thiol, and every place I looked up had that, don't forget you actually have a hydrogen here. So I would have mistakenly named this as a trans-2-butene-1-thiol. But everything I've looked up calls this an E. So that's something you might want to look up for yourself. But I just wanted to highlight, yes, I do see that. I would have mistakenly called it a trans. This is a website I really like. It's compound.com. It has a lot of different posters that it comes up with. It's, some of them are teaching posters. Some are just general interest. And I had a fun time when I found this one. This is the chemistry of body odors. 
And I thought this was neat because it shows a lot of sulfur containing compounds in here where you have underarm odor, foot odor, halitosis, and flatulence. And I thought this would be just something fun for you to look at. They gave the names of the compounds and also what they smell like. So this again is just for your interest to show you kind of everyday pieces of this. Again, the naming you'd be responsible for, but don't worry about memorizing which exact compounds are involved in underarm odor, for example. This is just to make this a little more interesting. So if you want to learn more, I do have the link on here. You can go ahead and uh, click on that link, or you might have to cut and paste, depending on how you're looking at this, and explore their website. It's Compound Interest is um, the name of their place, but the actual URL is compoundchem.com. And it's pretty interesting. I'm going to include some of these as uh, the rest of the semester goes along. All right, sulfide nomenclature. It's done very similar to the way we named ethers. And instead of using ether in the last name, you'll use sulfide. Or for more complex compounds, we would use an alkyl file method, just like we did alkoxy for the ethers. So go ahead and pause the video and go ahead and draw these structures. And come on back, restart the video so you could see how you did. All right, we have dimethyl sulfide, methyl phenyl sulfide. So we have our benzene ring. It does not have priority. That's telling me that sulfide has priority over that group. And here is an occasion when we would use the thiol when it's a little, just a little more, um, in this case, complicated because don't forget we have our double bond here. Cyclohexene, this double bond right here is on carbon number one. Carbon number two is the other side of the double bond and my thiol group starts on carbon number three. This piece right here is my methyl thiol group and it's on number three of my parent of cyclohexene. Okay, go ahead and draw these structures, pause the video, come on back and check your work. All right, we have two butane thiol. Remember the E stays there and I have carbon number two is where my SH is coming off. So two butane thiol. And the parent chain here, here's my SH. It's coming off of carbon number four of seven. Now going the way I've drawn this, one, two, three, four, it's right in the middle, one, two, three, four. So if I had this structure given to me and I had to generate the name, keep in mind the way I have mine drawn, you'd have to go from left to right because I have two of my methyls coming off carbon number two versus one. So also when anytime you have nomenclature, be sure to, if I ask you to draw it, be sure you to draw the structures and try to regenerate the name. And then this is one of the smaller ones where we have um, ethyl methyl sulfide. Remember alphabetically, E comes before M. I know I did draw the methyl on the left hand side, but when you list the name, it's always alphabetical, just like we have with ethers. All right, let's go ahead and make some thiols and then react them. The formation of alkyl thiols is done by an SN2 nucleophilic displacement reaction, and the yields tend to be poor unless excess nucleophile is used. And so I want you to notice in this case, I'm doing a net and, you know, kind of like a net ionic. I don't have the cation here. I have an example down here of a cation, but the general reaction is, is wherever your halogen is, the halogen is going to be replaced with an SH. So let's go ahead and take a look at the product over here. You're going to have your halogen with its minus sign. Remember, whatever you had as a cation here would actually be part of this here. And that's the example down here. So Pause the video, go ahead and write the product for this one and come on back and check your work. So we have SH substituting in place of where the BR was. Remember it's an SN2 reaction and my sodium's with my bromide. And this doesn't have any charges because it is neutral versus up here where I don't give the cation. It's more like a net ionic. So remember it says that this yield is pretty poor. So to get a better yield, it tells us we can use thiourea can be used to get a better yield. So the before and after picture is basically we're taking our halogen and we're substituting with an SH, but the reactants we're going to use are going to be different. So here is thiourea. This is a two-step reaction. So we have thiourea in the first step, and in the second step we use water and sodium hydroxide. So this is the set of reagents that gives us a better yield 
to do a substitution reaction of our halogen with an SH. Thiols can be easily oxidized into disulfide compounds. The mild oxidizing agent that we can use is hydrogen peroxide, iodine, or bromine. So I'm showing you an example here of iodine. This reaction is actually reversible using zinc and acid. So if you notice on my arrow here, the reverse arrow has zinc and hydrogen. That's the reagents needed to go in the reverse direction. That's why it's written below. And this is the reagents needed to go in the forward direction. So this is one way that I can show you two reactions with two different reagents, one going in the forward direction, one in the back. So what you get is a disulfide, and specifically because this has iodine, I have my minor secondary product is 2HI. So this is an example of a thiol being oxidized to a disulfide. And the reverse reaction would give us two moles of thiol. Here we have thiols reacting with an aqueous base, either sodium hydroxide or sodium hydride, to give a thiolate. So here is what a thiolate looks like. This is specifically sodium thiolate because sodium is with this one. And the thiolate, we, we have to make sure that you do put a minus sign with the sulfur, a positive sign with the sodium, and they're held together. You know, it's an ionic attraction. And so we have to make sure or, organic chemists love seeing those charges on there. I know the inorganic chemists are fine with them not being there, but the organic chemists love to see them. So we can now take our sodium thiolate and react it more. We can continue the reaction with it with a primary or secondary alkyl halide. So if you take a look here, I have a primary alkyl halide. In fact, iodine makes a great leaving group, so we see this. So primary and secondary with our alkyl halide is an SN2 mechanism. So it is stating that it's an SN2 mechanism. And what's going to happen is our sulfur is going to remain. So this would be um, generating, in this case, from a, thio, thio, a sodium thiolate, we're actually going to make ourselves a sulfide. So this reaction is truly going from a thiol to a thiolate to a sulfide. We can also use sulfides as nucleophiles. So we can actually, another way we can make a sulfide is to have our sulfur, the hydrogen in this case, is removed, and we have our R group with, in this case, it's a primary, and we have our bromide, and what's going to happen is we're going to attach wherever the halogen is. So sulfur compounds are more nucleophilic than oxygen analogs due to the valence electrons around the sulfur. They're further away from the nucleus and less tightly held, so they undergo these reactions a little bit better. Sulfides react with primary alkyl halides in an SN2 reaction to give trialkyl sulfonium salts. All right, take a look at these reactants here. Here's one of the smallest one, um, just two R groups, two methyl groups on each side. I just have a single carbon here with an iodine, great leaving group. THF, do you guys recall what that is? THF is tetrahydrofuran. It is a ether, cyclic ether, great solvent. So its job is not to participate in the reaction, but to give an area of a way for everyone to roam around and meet each other and undergo a reaction. So what we have here is our trialkyl sulfonium salt. So we have a positive sign on our sulfur. The iodine or the halogen becomes negatively charged, and these are just hanging out with each other. Sulfur is one of those compounds that can uh, prefers two bonds, but it can have an expanded octet, and it can have more than two bonds. So keep that in mind. Oxygen loves its two bonds. Sulfur, again, because it has its valence electrons further away from the nucleus, it can do some unusual bonding compared to oxygen. All right, more oxidation of sulfides. Sulfides are easily oxidized with hydrogen peroxide to form a sulfoxide. Another functional group you need to know, we have sulfur with four bonds here. We have oxidation of, sulf of a sulfoxide with a peroxy acid and it yields a sulfone. So now we have sulfur with six. In fact, we have an expanded octet. It's one of the few elements we have that can definitely hand it, handle an expanded octet. So, so far we have two new groups we need to learn, sulfoxide and sulfone. And then DMSO, you have probably used this before in reactions in general chemistry. It's dimethyl sulfoxide. 
It's often used as a polar aprotic solvent. So this is a name I want you to know and structure and initials I want you to know. Dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO. So what's coming up in your textbook is there's a preview of carbonyl compounds. And so next in your textbook, in between chapters 18 and 19, because we're finished with chapter 18 now, I want you to know that I want you to look at pages 743 to 752. In between chapters 18 and 19, they give you a beautiful preview of carbonyl compounds. What students tend to do is when you're done with chapter 18, you work on the problems, you do your homework in the chapter, and then when you come back to your book, you flip to chapter 19 and you may not realize these pages are there. So be sure to review and study these pages. It'll definitely help you better understand the material to come.